Thank you. Ah, what a wonderful way to start off. Something about music, it's like a, it's like a higher form of communication that goes right to our heart. This bypasses all kinds of concepts and analysis and intellectual maneuverings. It just goes straight in and, you know, we feel lifted by it. And that's kind of going to be a theme, the music today and then our, we'll have it throughout the day, then we'll have a very music-inspired movie tonight. Uh, I always loved the soundtracks of movies, I've always just felt like music is the soundtrack of our experience on earth. We need that to stay lifted, to stay high through it all, to get carried through. And tonight's movie will be strong in the music theme, but also very strong in the collaboration theme. That Jesus teaches us in A Course in Miracles, miracles are a collaborative venture. That's an interesting couple words to put with miracles, a collaborative venture. And we start to realize, he also teaches us, you know, the solitary journey to God fails, because it is a collaborative venture, it is a sense of joining and connecting. And it seems like with events like this, we've come from all over to come together for this beautiful event, but, but deep inside we know we're just going deeper into our heart and we, we're going deeper into an experience of our mind, that, that we're joined together in mind. There's a friend of mine, Resta, who received about 270 songs from the angels, and one of the songs was called Family. And the, the end of the, the chorus is, Family, family, holy and whole are my family. And Kindness and love are the, the feelings that bind the family that lives in the mind. We, we're starting to realize that our union is, is in our mind. We share the same mind. We share it with God, we share it with each other, and what we perceive as our earthly conditions, our earthly life, is so different than the Kingdom of Heaven. Even what Jesus calls the real world, or the happy dream, he says it's, it's not like the world you see at all. There are no s stores to buy endless things you don't even need and don't even want. I mean, he starts, he starts to make a parody. He does this all through the course. In Lesson 76, he says you really believe you would starve unless you had piles of green paper strips and metal discs. He pokes fun at money, he pokes fun at our shopping, he pokes fun at the things that we want, and he pokes fun at our jobs and occupations. Do, he says doing things that you don't, not, don't even want to do to get things that you don't really want, and then to continue doing the same pattern over and over again. And that's what seems to be the monotony of the world. And usually human beings from time to time just take a pause when they're brushing their hair or brushing their teeth to go, Really? Really? Another day of this? Really? Did I sign up for this? Really? You know, because we long for a sense of connection, we long for a sense of relaxation, a sense of ease, a sense of flow, a sense of harmony. And Jesus is telling us, yeah, this, you long for these things because it's your natural condition. That's how you were created. That's how you are in the state of mind that you were created in. And then this belief in lack or scarcity, this, this invention of duality, and along with the invention of duality is, is comparison. You know, comparison is just like this nagging thing that's in the split mind that it just, 
It's like they call it in the East the monkey mind. The, it's just chattering and chattering and comparing and comparing and comparing. And every comparison is a judgment. So it's just judging, judging, judging. It's like a ticker tape, like a Wall Street ticker tape. You know, just going, going, chatter, 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 chatter. And, and to pull away from that, we do need collaboration. We do need something to focus on together. We want to come together. We don't want to come together with a pressure of productivity. We don't want to come to, together with a pressure of trying to forge a desired outcome. It's more like a, a group of band members that come together and, and decide bef before they even practice, they just want to, let's just have a jam session. Everybody just plays what they feel and then we'll kind of riff off each other and we'll just feel our way into the jam session and then feel what a good vibe that is. We know when it starts to just come through us naturally without any sense of trying to personally direct or control it. And that's really our prayer in collaboration is to, to not have a feeling like there's leaders or followers or anyone in charge, but it's just like we're tuning into that vibration and that harmony that is very, very natural. Tonight's movie will be a very strong dose of, of that feeling where you, you get a you know, you're going to see world famous musicians coming together, living together, living close by, stopping off at each other's houses, um, getting inspired by one another, bouncing off ideas from one another, riffing back and forth, and then letting the music come through them in a way that everyone is blessed. And they're not really concerned about copyright. They're not concerned, you know, if, if uh, the Beatles come over to California and they hear the Beach Boys or the Birds or some of those great songs that came out of the, the 60s and 70s, they're, they're inspired by it. They, they want to just start writing music immediately. Oh, wow, the, the Birds, they're doing the, this real cool stuff, but it's kind of got a a different sound to it. It's, it's got a different sound, it's a different music, but then the birds are inspired by the Beatles, the Beatles by the birds, the Beach Boys, Brian Wilson seems to be tuning into some kind of frequency and harmonies, Beethoven and, and ones from way centuries gone by, and they're all just rejoicing and beholding the beauty and the love and the connection that's coming through. And the collaborations and the cooperation and that sense of melding together and joining, it just lifts everyone higher and higher. And away from competition, away from comparison, away from analysis. You know, the things that we were raised with to survive, the competition, the analysis, I remember when A Course in Miracles first came into my experience, I think it was when I was about 28 years old. And 28 in the Parable of David was a time where you're supposed to be, you know, establishing your, your vocation for your lifetime and, and carving out your niche and putting all your skills together and building your image and, and getting prepared for the future. And then when I started praying and reading the Course, I thought, I, I sensed right away that the goal of the Course was in completely opposite direction from everything else I had been doing. And Jesus says that in the Course. You may have noticed that the goal of this Course is completely different from any goal that you've ever held. Because all of our goals were future-oriented, and this seems to be a goal of present peace. In fact, it even seems strange when, when we hear the goal of present peace, you know, it's, that's not a goal. How can, it can't even be a goal. If it's not about the future, it can't be a goal. <laughs> it's not, that's not right. Don't use that word, Jesus, goal. 
It's not right. But he said, no, the goal is God and God is present. And you must come to the present moment. You must see the value of the present moment. Even though all, everything you've learned has taught you to devalue the present moment, to skip over the present moment, to not have any inkling of how tremendously helpful the present moment is. In fact, that's where our life is, that's where our love is. So I know for me, that's when I thought, wow, this is going to take a lot of trust because I seem to be in a quicksand, <laughs> stuck in a quicksand of time and space where everything and everyone around me is saying, what are you going to do with your life? Uh, are you going to go to school? What about your career? What, what are your plans? What are your goals? It seems like yeah, this was the time and place called Earth, the place of future goals. And everything was so future oriented. And then, you know, you get little glimmers like, you know, you see in the in the 60s and you see that we saw in the movie yesterday, the hippies, you know, down by the beach and laughing, singing, congregating, having encounter groups, you know, that that was a kind of an amazing thing to even come together and encounter groups to just discover something new. Instead of just playing out the same old methodical rituals that everybody seemed to be playing out. Just to have a, a, an encounter group to come together and say, let's just practice openness today. Let's just encounter each other as if for the first time. Let's use our time on earth for discovery instead of aiming to build an image or build something in the world. Let's, let's learn it to discover something that will last forever. Like our character Greg in the movie, you know, he says, I believe there are such things as absolutes and, and then uh, Kathy sa says, like what? He said, I, I don't know, I haven't found it yet, but I know it's there. You know, that's kind of the situation we find ourselves in. We know it's there, but we haven't found it. We can't put our finger on it. We can't, we can't get into a direct access of it. So, I feel like that's what we really start to, that we, we just want to say, okay, I want to, I want to connect, I want to join, I want to be part of something that, that will last forever. I want to be connected to something that is truly valuable, that won't pass away, like everything else that I perceive in this world. And Jesus says, yeah, if you have a single purpose, a single intent, that that is a way. Only a constant purpose can stabilize perception. That he's saying that as long as we believe in the ego, our perception will be highly variable and we will feel anxious, we will feel stressed, we will feel guilty, we will have regrets, and our perception will be in such high frequency of flux that we won't understand what the meaning certainty means. We, we, certainty in what? In all this flux? What is certain? <laughs> Everything's f changing, 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 changing. And the ego is the belief that things would be different. Things would be better if they were different. So if you just summarize the ego's theme, things would be better if they were different. It means that the mind is perceiving a changing world because it doesn't know the truth, it's forgotten who it is, and now it's searching among all these options and images, and it seems like an endless search. Like we, we try to acquire, we try to possess, we try to control, we try to grasp, you know, there's a, a workbook lesson, my, my self, my Christ self is ruler of the universe, but he says it's impossible that anything come to you unbidden by, by yourself, by your mind. That everything you experience is simply brought to you because of your wish for it. You wish for the ego, you wish for separation, and then 
you find yourself perceiving a world where everything is in flux and no matter what straws you grasp on, they don't really lead anywhere. Jesus even has a point where he says that there comes a point where you start to, where men have realized that all of the roadways of the world, he doesn't say some, he says all of the roadways of the world lead to death. That's an amazing statement. All of the roadways of the world lead to death. And then he says men have died upon seeing this. Yeah, I would imagine that's, that's more than despair, that's ultimate despair. All of the roadways of the world lead to death. And he said, and yet, if they'd just gone one more step beyond that point of desperation, of intense desperation, if they'd gone one more step beyond it, they would have been lifted to heights of happiness. One step beyond all of the roadways of the world lead to death is heights of happiness. It's, it's escape from the world. And it seems to be so mystical. I, I mean, that's why people talk about mystical experiences as being very rare. And even throughout history, there's so many stories and chapters and wars and, and triumphs and kings and queens and rulers and peasants and, and disease and all kinds of stories of those things. And then we have these little sparkling little sparkles of light which we call mysticism and mystics, and they seem to be, either they've discovered or they're onto, they're onto it. Something that's absolute, something that's beyond this world. And that's what we want. We want something that will last forever, not something that's passing, that's temporary. We want something that is sure, that is there, that is absolute. So for me, when I got into the Course, I started to see that, that Jesus was saying, well, the, the most direct way to the Absolute is, in this world is guidance. Is that you have a, an intuitive voice, you have an inner guide, and it's very much like when uh, Neo meets Morpheus in the Matrix movie, and Morpheus says to Neo, I can guide you. It's, it's over the phone, uh, actually the first meeting of the phone ringing when he's in his office with all the cubicles. I can guide you, but you must do exactly as I say. And this works out a bit until he gets to the, the ledge and, and Morpheus says over the phone, you can use the scaffolding to get to the roof. I leave it to you. And then we see Neo going, no way, what did I do? I didn't do anything to deserve this. He's actually called for an answer and he's made contact with the voice, but actually that's when the phone flies out of his hand and he says, I can't do this. And he lets the agents come and take him in, uh, take him away. And that's very much a metaphor for the spiritual journey that all of us are in touch with, there must be this intuitive guide within us that can guide us beyond the matrix. It can take us beyond this matrix of complexity, this matrix of duality. And, and so that's the adventure. And to me that's what it means by miracles are a collaborative adventure. He does talk a little bit about revelation, but he says it's, it's, it's literally beyond description and it's just basically communication from your Creator to you. It's the Creator to your mind. But he says, miracles on the other hand are, are interpersonal. Isn't that great that there's something that's interpersonal while we believe in this dream of persons? We need something that can reach us. Because if it's over our head, if it's beyond what we can relate to, it's not going to help us at all. You know, it's almost like a, a giant hand coming down, and, but it's too high, you can't reach it. <laughs> okay, thank you for the help, but <laughs> it's like, wait, that, could you come down, lower it down a little bit? <laughs> and, and so Jesus is like, yeah, 
your world is fake and that's okay, we're good with fake and we've got miracles for you and we've got lots of them and that's why it's titled A Course in Miracles because if it was A Course in Revelation it could be a paragraph long. It wouldn't have to be 600 and some pages. It wouldn't need a workbook lesson or a manual for teachers for A Course in Revelation. It's, that's just the direct mystical experience. So in my early years with the Course, I was relaxing and going to Course groups and praying and using my Course book as like an oracle. And then at some point I, I did do the turn on, tune in and drop out. I dropped out of, after 10 years of university, at the University of Cincinnati. And immediately I, I was guided to buy a little travel trailer maybe 12 foot, 15 foot, and, and put it down in the woods of, of Kentucky, northern Kentucky. And I would go there and pray and meditate. And I, it was kind of me dropping out of what they call the rat race, or academia, jobs, careers, and everything, just to take my course book down and pray and meditate and just try to go into what it was pointing to. And that was a very important phase because after that phase, you know, came a point when it was actually during the latter part of that phase when I had three revelatory experiences where the, the whole universe disappeared and I was just enraptured in what Jesus calls the Great Rays, capital G, capital R, and, and revelatory experience. And I think that was, that's very, very rare, but that was very helpful for me because it, it was a way of giving me a glimpse of eternity. You know, even if you, if you were hungry and you just got a smell of food, it would, it would tell you, I'm close to something. Uh, and when, when you're hungry for love and you're hungry for peace, and these revelatory experiences were more like a, just a glimpse of eternity. The figure ground of the world collapsed and then the blazing light came and then the world disappeared three different times. And I thought, okay, all right, I got it. Okay, okay, my, my way is set now. I'm not, I'm not doubting <laughs> this path. But then come all the miracles. That's where all the, I didn't like to travel. David, the character, didn't like to travel and I was sent on enormous travels. The character David was voted most quiet in senior class, very timid, shy, quiet, thrown into a realm of speaking. And not just speaking about anything, speaking about God and forgiveness, which my parents had warned me when I was younger, that don't ever speak in public on, about God or politics, <laughs> or you're in for a, a shitstorm <laughs> if, it, if you start to talk in, in public about God or politics. That will that'll flare up at you like nothing you've ever seen. But it seemed like that was part of my assignment, was to pray, listen, follow, and then allow myself to be spoken through, kind of like a channel or an oracle. And Jesus does say in the Course that that is the one right use of the body, is to let the body be used as a communication device. And we know that with, with music, we know that with speaking, smiles, hugs, laughter, it feels good in our heart when we're in the, that alignment with that purpose. That purpose is so, 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 so freeing. So, as we go into collaboration, you know, uh, that's pretty much, this monastery's been here for 15 years, but this whole monastery has been very much of a collaborative venture. It's been very much like a painting that we just keep coming and, and adding our colors and brush strokes to. Not as a place that's supposed to be special or different in any way, but just to practice our collaboration, to practice our, our sharing, our extending of love. I, one time I did a, a word search in A Course in Miracles on the word ownership, and what came back was 
to the Holy Spirit, ownership is sharing. Do you see how diametrically opposite that definition is from the world's definition of ownership? To own is to possess. To own is to control. To own is a sense of mine, or my, or mine. And to the Holy Spirit, ownership is sharing. Oh my gosh, that's striking. And that gives my mind permission to say, okay, well what would it be like to give, to give, to truly be truly generous in all ways. And above all with the Beatitudes, with, with my attitude, wouldn't it be wonderful to, to be a demonstration of God's love, to give as God gives, without any reciprocity, without expecting things in return. Wouldn't that transform my relationships? Wouldn't that transform my emotions? Wouldn't that transform my very perspective of the world? If I decided to let go of getting, the getting mechanism of the ego, and go for the giving. But giving without conditions, agape love, unconditional love, universal love. And, and I think the key to coming to universal love is we have to start to realize, be shown by Jesus and the Holy Spirit, the absolute impossibility of comparison. Because comparison always involves two. And what Jesus is showing us at the miracle is, there's really only one of us. This has been a, f a, a fictitious game, pretty vicious fictitious game of, of comparison and competition and analysis. And it's gone from something that is, hmm, what if things could be different than heaven, to now a Overlearning something that's very, very not aligned with reality. And so, in one sense, we do have to do, like Morpheus had, uh, actually it was, uh, it was one of um, Neo's buddies who said, looks like you need to unplug. And that is another good word for drop out, unplug. We need to unplug from the ego. We do not need to feed it with the power of our mind anymore. This puff of nothingness has been magnified into seemingly a whole cosmos now, but it's time to say enough. I'm not going to stay plugged in to this belief system anymore. I'm going to let my perception be retranslated by a new purpose by a new focus. There's one part too <clears throat> in the stages of the development of trust where Jesus says, you will not go on alone from here. Mighty companions travel with you. And somebody recently said, well, Ken Wapnick said, mighty companions are, are your th in your thoughts. And I said, yeah, that's exactly it. As, as we begin to turn to this new purpose, our thoughts start to become purified by the Holy Spirit. We start to let go of those egoic thoughts, those grievances, those judgments, those attack thoughts. And it does seem that the world starts to light up in our awareness. We are perceiving more and more and more and more, we could call them mighty companions, reflections of our new purpose not reflections of our old purpose. That's how the conversion works, because how else could we be induced to let go of our make-believe world unless we had a bridge to cross, unless we had something that was palpable, something that was, you know, we could really relate to. We need signs and symbols that point to something beyond this world. And that's our function, you know, it's even when we give the Holy Spirit the use of our body, then we know that the Holy Spirit will speak that what is to come has, is already gone, he says. Meaning, 
this future thing that we were so uncertain about is actually part of the past, that we've just categorized it as the future, but it's just future stories. Past stories and future stories, and Jesus says stories are stories, and they're all past. You, you are literally projecting thoughts that you wish would happen in the future, and you're just literally making a future. And you're stressing yourself out with a lot of worries and concerns about this future, but, but it's because you're holding off to the past thoughts. And the ego's throwing a trick of the future as if it has not happened yet. That's why psychics can seemingly, in some cases, predict the future. Nostradamus is, is one of them. Uh, I saw something a couple days ago on, on the news, and it said it was a very famous blind Bulgarian psychic. Anybody heard of her? She was very famous. She's passed away now, but she said, the beginning of the end of the world will begin in 2025. <laughs> That's next year. He said, the, the beginning of the end, is it like a nuclear holocaust? No, it's just the beginning of the end. It, and then the world will end in 5089. <laughs> I said, That's kind of a pessimistic prediction of the future. <laughs> the world will begin to end in 2025 next year. Well, we do have an, a lot of elections going on around the planet right now. It will begin to end in 2025 and it will end in 5089. Almost like it's just wounded and, and gasping for a few thousand <laughs> years. And then... <laughs> and Jesus has got a different view than this, than the Bulgarian psychic, the blind woman, and he's saying the world will end in laughter because it was a place of sorrow. You can see the perspective is very different. The world will end in laughter because it was a place of sorrow. He's, he's really teaching us this, is a, this has been a perceptual nightmare of your own making. You gave your mind over to the ego and this is what you got. But, but when you are able to laugh at the ego, you will be able to laugh at its world too. And, and that is his Genesis story. There's no snake talked about in the Bible. There's no tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Uh, there's no Adam and Eve, basically, but but he just tells us in the Course, into eternity where all is one, there crept a tiny mad idea at which the Son of God remembered not to laugh. The original problem of seriousness with this world is not laughing at the tiny mad idea. And, and for him, he's like saying, it is laughable. It's a belief in separation. And it's not possible. And an appropriate response to something so ridiculous is laughter. But if you take it serious, if you believe in it, then the consequences of the belief seem to be quite serious. And that's what the predicament we're looking at with taking serious that which is not serious at all. But it seems serious because it's given belief. It's given credibility. It's, it's given reality. Uh, it's the attempt to give reality to something that doesn't have reality. So I find the collaborations are a, a soft way of easing our way out of, of taking this so seriously. And yeah, if you talk to the, if you talk to the band members, if you talk to those that have helped prepare this place and, and this stage and everything here, they will tell you the same story. You know, it's a good day is when you can la remember to laugh and not take any of it seriously and feel like you're just at play. You don't even have the concept of work in your mind. You know, because work is a very linear idea. It's a very linear concept. But play is not. When you're in that playful state of just being done through, the Spirit coming through you, 
you're actually just using the present moment to be playful and to loosen from the identification with the body, the identification with the doer. And that's the ultimate collaboration, is joining with spirit in that. To be carefree, you know, to live a, a carefree life, you know, that sounds very relaxing. And, and, and yet, I would say that would be the most practical thing you could go for, to live a carefree life. Some people of the world might say, that's, that's lazy. Carefree is lazy? No, carefree is aligned. Carefree is in the harmony of knowing all is working together for good. It's carefree is filled with trust. Carefree is full of faith. You know, all the things that Jesus talked about and, and was guiding us to and stayed in it. He just stayed in his faith because if, if he had given any credibility to the ego, he would have given way to frustration, doubt, uh, and all of the dark emotions that come from the ego. He would not have been able to take the high road. He would not have been able to demonstrate that everything that you believe about this world can be transcended and actually already has been transcended. So, tonight we'll go into that in great detail with, with the movie, with the music and the collaborations. But I thought today's session we could just do like we did in the first session is, is really start to just open it up into an interactive session where you just say, okay, here's what I'm facing right now, or here's what I'm dealing with, or here's what seems to be my top issue that, that is preoccupying my mind. Because if we can loosen the tethers, if we can loosen those, those chains around one of the key issues that the ego is using as a trick to preoccupy your mind, then there's a burst of of joy. There's a burst of confidence. There's a burst of, oh, I'm, I'm free. And, and we need a lot of those bursts of freedom because he's telling us that, he says in the Course, prisoners who have lived me long periods of time in chains with their eyes closed and turned away from the light do not immediately spring up when the chains are free. They've been so conditioned. It's like Plato's cave analogy, you know. One gets out, gets out past, sees the marionettes and sees the bright light behind the marionettes, comes back in to tell the prisoners, and they're in total disbelief of what he's saying, and they kill him. <laughs> it's like Plato's cave analogy. It's like a, a prophecy of what would happen with Jesus. <laughs> you know, he escapes to the light, he comes back to tell the prisoners, and then the prisoners kill him. Because <laughs> it sounds too beyond this world, you know. It, it's too difficult to relate to. It overthrows everything of tradition, everything of the past, uh, what he's speaking about. So, do we have a microphone? And, yeah, Trent has the, the red microphone. I thought that's one of the, the best ways to go at this, is just to start off, here's a hand up right over here. Uh, we've got a couple hands going up there. And let's just take it in nice and slow from what seems to be the predicament, or the, the struggle, or the issue, and see if we can loosen that. Hi everybody. Ooh. I'm going to try and remain composed. Okay. Um, thank you for your teaching and thank you to the musicians and the crew that put this together. Um, I've never been at such peace in my life. My, one of my first prayers when I wake up is thank you for everything. I have no complaints whatsoever. I read that in, um, from Bichna, um years ago, and I've been saying it, and it's taken effect. 
Um, <clears throat> And I found that um, I was, I've always been searching since my teens and all the teachings, I always thought this is it until I found Course in Miracles and I know this is it. And, and I appreciate all that I've um, listened and read about throughout the years. Um, and my affirmations have turned into prayers. They, at first they were, um, I, I had a lot of resistance and reluctance as I said them. One of them was, I am one with everything and everything is one with me. And my immediate thought was, oh, come on. I'm not the same as a tree or a rock. And uh, over time, I, I have come to believe it. And, and your music was the hook for me. When I first heard you, I thought, and, and, I, and you have a nice voice too, by the way, mm -hmm. but how you could break into a song and relate it to the teaching and remember all the lyrics, how they just come to you, um, was amazing and it, it really, I was hooked. And the movies too. Um, <clears throat> so today, I, um, I have a very blissful life almost every minute. When I, when I don't, I can center myself pretty quickly. And I, I've come a long way, but I know I have a long way to go. And if I want uh, the drama in my life, I just quickly go to um, politics. And, uh, and sometimes I do it for the drama, but I can bounce out of it now. Um, and I, I believe that it's possible to be uh, supremely happy every minute and if there's anyone that I've ever known it's you who <laughs> you've you've really got so much I mean I, I, I you don't have an ego <laughs> I don't see any ego when I listen to you and how is that possible how is that possible I, I've been practicing and I'm not complaining I have no complaints but, um, and I like everything that you've said the last yesterday and today, you've answered all my questions, but this question, I want you know, it's the same age old question. How do I get there faster? Thank you. Okay. Yeah, I think, I think, well, one line that comes to mind right away is, is seek not to change the world, seek rather to change your mind about the world. And when you really go into the first part of Seek Not to Change the World, you can really feel that that is an invitation from Spirit to give up the idea of control for once and for always. You know, to just be able to observe without a desire coming up to control. Which, like you mentioned politics, that can be a temptation too, to uh, try to perceive something and then there's an impetus to do something. Do something. Somebody do something or something like this. Even, even vote, <laughs> you know, is, is part of an action. It's a, there's an impetus. But I think in order to let go of control, we need to practice being used by the Spirit in a very helpful, constructive way. And I have, I have listened to the course on audio and, and listened to so many different things and, and it seems to be, again, even if you go back to the Ur text of A Course in Miracles, there's all this talk about being used in a constructive way, being used in a helpful way, being used in a way that blesses the whole universe. And it's quite a surrender there because as a human being, there are goals, there are ambitions, there are concepts that the mind is drawn to, and they are time concepts, and they are blocks to the, to the entering into the holy instant. But, but we have to allow those symbols that we've given meaning to, those skills and abilities that we've learned, to be retranslated. We, it's almost, he says, you have to let all your skills and abilities be channelized in one direction. 
meaning being constructively used by the Holy Spirit. That just means like every moment of every day we're praying to be truly helpful, to be shown what it is to be truly helpful, to be done through by the Spirit, to let the Spirit use the puppet and use the puppet and use the puppet in a very practical, realistic way until we start to feel more the draw to a silence that even transcends that use of the puppet. It's just a deep silence that's in the mind. And, and things that we once believed in start to fade away. They just get further and further in our awareness. You know, it's like in the, in the movie The Matrix, when, he, when Neo first goes for a ride in The Matrix, you know, he's, he's talking to the group of, that are in the car with him and, and he, they pass by, I think it's a Korean restaurant, he said, oh yeah, that's, that's where they have the good noodles. And he's still looking back on experiences and memories that he had before. And that happens with all of us, even as we go through spiritual transformation, you know. We're looking at a particular food, we're thinking, I used to really like this. Now it doesn't mean anything. And then, for me, it's gone past that to now, it's like the appetite just goes, goes down, 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 down. And there's this faint memory of enjoying a meal <laughs> that gets farther and farther away. And it's so spooky to the ego, because the ego's like, oh, come on. <laughs> <laughs> it's because it was familiar, it was kind of so familiar as part of the experience and then it just starts to fade, fade, fade away. And I still feel that Jesus says, yeah, the body will be used for all helpful or constructive uh, things. It, its usefulness remains. He's not really so concerned with the condition of the body, but he's concerned with the usefulness. Always, everything's always about the purpose and the usefulness. And to me, that's where we get our, our joy, it's intrinsic. We get our energy, we get our aliveness, we get our spontaneity. Even remembering songs, not just remembering the lyrics of the songs, but just right in the teaching at the point where it's most appropriate, the Spirit puts a song in. And that is beautiful, that's helpful, it's like, it's, it's transferring the training. It's like Jesus and the Holy Spirit are saying very humorously, w just watch me. I, they, they say, I can use anything. I can transfer anything. That whatever you believed about it, it can be used in a way that is helpful for the whole universe. And that's what we're surrendering into. And when we really look at it that way, it, we have a, a desire to do it. We say, okay, good, use me. Like that uh, Bill Withers song, you just keep on using me until you use me up, <laughs> until you use mini me up, <laughs> until you use the puppet up, until you can cut the strings and, and just go merge with the mind. You don't need to use the puppet anymore. So to me, that also leads it to what we're going to show in the movie tonight because you know, these musicians that are going to be in this movie are going to come together and be together, visit each other, they live near each other. Their day is just all filled with music and, and going and collaborating and joining together to just let the beautiful music come through them. And you can tell that it's washing away the ego because there's gratitude there. There's genuine friendships, there's genuine kindness, there's genuine respect. There's all those kind of traits that we know, we recognize as, as being lined up with, with truth. And there's also openness and candor. You know, I find in the movie tonight, these musicians are, are so open and candid and they are practicing no private thoughts. And they're doing it with humor. They're, they're sharing it with laughter, you know. That's how you know you're, you're joining with the Holy Spirit, when you can share the private thoughts with laughter. When you can laugh at those thoughts, there has to be a recognition that they're not real to be able to laugh at them. To me, that's the practical way that we 
lay down the ego is is through those collaborations. So I know for myself in my life and and for those that I live with and work with, we yeah, we do live like you a very very prayerful life. It's it's a very prayerful life. We're not trying to jump jump into things without praying first. You know, it's very much like Mary Baker Eddy used to say, you know, it was like to pray first, pray first. And then the more you keep praying first, it starts to be more like a continuous prayer. <laughs> it's not a first or a last with it, you know, it's just like you're living a prayerful life. Because you're wanting to be connected, you're wanting to experience miracles. Prayer is the medium of, of miracles. Prayer is, is what miracles come from. They come from the prayer of the heart. So that's the best advice I can give is just continue on that way and, and live a prayerful devotional life. And, and obviously we pay close attention to our emotions and, and to our mind, to our thoughts. And we just keep praying the prayer of, of purification, of, of dedication, of devotion. And and then the symbols and witnesses keep showing up. I mean, look at look at this. Even if we look at it from the perspective of the dream, this scene in the dream, if we saw it as a quantum field, this this scene is a beautiful reflection of that desire to connect and join and have that love and laughter and sharing. You know, this this is a beautiful witness. And I think back in the parable of David. With, that's really, the prayer underneath was just to, to be used in a helpful way, to join and to connect. And then, uh, we nowadays we have a lot of laughter when things just pop and show us in such an obvious way or an obvious sign comes in. We just rejoice in the sign or the symbol because it's just a reminder to us of what our prayer is. So thank you, thank you for that. Good morning. Good morning. I uh, was a little bit hesitant to even bring this up in this group setting, but you mentioned, let's see if we can take whenever that hook is away. Um, so my body had experienced cancer starting in 2018, but I can say I was grateful for it because it caused me to slow down enough to have an awakening, found the Course in Miracles. It's completely transformed my life. And um, I didn't really have a second thought about it. I got over it, was in remission, everything's fine. <laughs> and then recently it came back with a vengeance and uh, the medical professionals diagnosed, you know, stage four and I had three years left. And it brought about like, oh, like how did this happen again? And I know that sickness is all mental, like you brought up yesterday. Um, but I'm just working through that and Maybe you can help me find the hook. Yeah, I think it's just like with the first time you had it, where you you took it as an opportunity to to go inside or to change what was necessary to change uh, in a guided way, in an intuitive guided way. There's one part in the Course of Miracles where Jesus says. Change is the greatest gift that God blessed his, the sleeping son with. And because and, we don't tend to think of change as a gift from God. <laughs> you know, the exact, if God's eternal, <laughs> if God doesn't, he didn't seem to know about change, but then Jesus is saying it's the greatest gift with which God blessed the, the sleeping son. And what that was, was the, the Holy Spirit, which is the ability, the remembrance and the ability to change our mind. He tells us, change your mind about your mind. And we're used to thinking about changing the form, changing something in form, changing our diet, our exercise, changing what we do, our vocation, changing our rituals, changing our story changing our partners, changing something. 
And and the course is really about changing your mind about your mind. And it's not like the change that he's asking for is a real change. I would say the word that fits better with what we're going for is acceptance. So he says in lesson 139, I will accept atonement for myself. And atonement is correction. I will accept correction for myself. So that's what he means by change your mind about your mind. That's the lesson underneath something like getting a diagnosis of stage 4 cancer. Again, everything has to be working together for the good. God is for us in every instant. God is never against us. God is not testing us. God is not putting us through trials. You know, a lot of the things we've heard of our lifetime, God is, well, God is just testing you. Yeah, well, I don't know if I want to meet a God that's testing me. <laughs> I would rather not. <laughs> testing me, oh, oh, you know. But, but if we start to realize that, that there is always a golden opportunity, and I would say that golden opportunity is atonement. There's two parts of the Course where he says, the sole responsibility of the miracle worker is to accept the atonement for himself. And then he comes at another angle, the sole responsibility of the teacher of God is to accept the atonement for himself. When Jesus uses the word like sole responsibility, S-O-L-E, means only, the only responsibility, that tells me I need to look at my mind closely, deeply, and look at where the hooks are. Where do I still feel responsible? Do I feel responsible for this body or for certain bodies in this world, certain people? Are there certain configurations that I think I feel more responsible for? Maybe I, I feel responsible for this one, this one, this one, this one, not for the Eskimos, not for the, you know, the one, you know, <laughs> out of the 7.8 billion, now, they're, they're irrelevant, but here's the ones, <laughs> here's the ones that I'm feeling responsible for. And it could even be for a single body, the body that we felt is our personality self, that we're responsible for our actions. That's a common thing, right? People say, of course you're responsible for your actions. Jesus is teaching us, you're responsible for your state of mind. And what you do comes from what you think. And thinking is the realm of causation, mind. And the bodies and actions are the realm of effects. And so we're conditioned to be so concerned about the effects and we ignore the cause. We, we're concerned about our behavior, we're concerned about our weight, we're concerned about our appearance, we're concerned about how we sound, whether we're articulate, whether we're sound intelligent, all these things, we're concerned about the effects, the projections. But Jesus is saying, only at the level of thought can there be true change. So as much as we struggle with losing weight or stopping different addictions and everything like this, we have an addicted mind, and our mind is addicted to linear time. And that's the core of it. They should come up with a new AA 12-step uh, meeting. Hi, my name is so-and-so, I'm addicted to time. Hey, okay, the next one. I, my name is so-and-so, I'm addicted to time. Ah, okay, everyone goes around. Yeah, okay. And, and the purpose of the 12-step group is to give up the addiction, right? So. We're coming back to that present moment thing. We, we have to surrender to the moment, to that instant guidance, to that flow within. And if that's our sole responsibility, then it must mean that we're not responsible for all the other things that we've taken responsibility for. And if we've taken responsibility for things that we're not really responsible for, there's guilt. That's how the ego keeps this world going, is guilt. Ontological guilt. And it's pushed out of awareness, the belief in separation. And now we're guilty with parents, children, we're guilty with co-workers, we're guilty with neighbors and spouses. We're, we feel the guilt, even with our personhood, 
we haven't done enough, what did we do wrong, what could we do better, what should we have never done, our life would be so good if we just hadn't done this one thing. You know, it's guilt, 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 guilt. It's a loop of guilt. And I would say it's a loop of guilt based on false responsibility. So, that's where we really need the guidance. You know, the, this diagnosis of stage 4 cancer is just like a little, like a little flare going up. <laughs> Shooting up a flare into a dark sky going, okay, important lesson here. And, and that important lesson is, it's like in Lion King, you know, where Simba, you know, he believes he's, he's there with his dad and he, Scar, his uncle, says, you killed your father, now run. And he runs away, he runs away from the Pride Land and he runs away and then he gets caught up with in uh, Akuna Matata. We've all got, got lost in the Akuna Matata too, we know. We've got a lot of things we call spiritual that are really akuna matata. We're just doing all these things, still being busy, still feeling guilty, and we're singing akuna matata, no cares, no worries for the rest of your life. You know, we're, we've fooled ourselves with akuna matata. But in The Lion King, he, uh, Narla comes from the Pride Land and says, you know, you've got to come back, Simba. You've got to return to the homeland and you've got to face, Scar has taken over, you've got to face what, what seems to have happened. You have to face the belief in you've killed your father. You have to face that scar, that dark darkness. You have to go through it, you have to face it. And on the way back, he's doubting, 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 doubting. And then Rafiki the monkey comes and says, you know, look into the pool and Look closer. He said, no, there's nothing in there, my, just my reflection. Look closer. And then it's, it's the father. His father comes back and he's like from, from above. Remember. Remember. There it is. That's our Course in Miracles right there. That movie is A Course in Miracles. Remember. 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 And then he does go to face his darkness. And, and that's what this is. It's just a call to, to go very deep and face the darkness that is blocking the remembrance of God uh, uh, and the remembrance of Christ, the, the true identity in the mind. So it's like the little flare going up saying, this is important. You know, you're, you didn't come to waste time. You came to let time be used in the most beneficial way to let go of time to let go of the cares and the anxieties and the worries. But the world is so much based on the body identity that, that when somebody would say is a, a diagnosis of stage four cancer would be a serious thing if and only if the body was a serious thing. You know, it's, it's a learning device among all the images that were made, you know. If I said that this cup, you know, this yellow cup had stage four cancer, everyone would laugh. You're going, cups don't, cups don't get cancer. Uh, they don't have cancer cells in them. They, it doesn't happen. But Jesus is trying to take us into a state of mind to see that, to, to project those kind of things onto any of the images of the world, whether they're cups or butterflies or caterpillars or bodies, you have to believe in error before that projection can take place. And like, you know, Wayne Dyer, before he passed away, he was saying, what, he said, everything in this world is just like on loan, including our bodies. It's just on loan. And, and we shouldn't get too hung up on something that's just temporarily lent on loan for the use of a higher purpose. We should be more focused on what that higher purpose is that we're using the body for than focus on the body as an end in itself that can get sick and because the seriousness around like stage four cancer is is 
basically believing that there's life in the body. I remember early on, many, many years ago, yeah, I was listening, I was doing the dishes and I was listening to Ken Wapnick, Wapnick talk on a tape and somebody asked in the seminar, asked Ken the question, they said, uh, what does the Course say about life on other planets? And Ken said, the Course says there's no life on this planet. <laughs> and I just stopped doing the dishes and just got a big smile on my face and went, that's it, that's it. That's where all the concern comes in, is we've, we've taken eternal life, pushed it out of awareness, forgot about it completely, like an amnesia, and then we give life to the puppets, like Pinocchio. He's just a wood puppet, and then the whole story of Pinocchio is he wants to be a real boy. And whoa, when he becomes a real boy, he's got a conscious Jiminy Cricket, his Holy Spirit here, and he doesn't want to listen to his conscious. He's now achieved the goal of being a real boy. He doesn't want to listen to Jiminy Cricket, you know, which is his salvation. And then he gets taken off into Pleasure Island, and then he turns into half boy, half donkey. It goes pretty bad <laughs> when he gets his wish to be a real boy. God did not create the body, so a real boy is, is an oxymoron. Real is spirit, boy, illusion. Human being. Human, illusion, being, real. <laughs> Contradiction. The birds are put together as if they're real, human being. One's not real and one's real. And Jesus is like, stop trying to mix the unreal with the real. That's your problem. The only problem is you're trying to give reality to the make-believe. You make up something invented, fictitious, and then you so ways a magic wand, now you're real. And then the trouble starts when we try to give reality to something that God didn't create. If God's real and Christ is real, that's all we really need to come to a remembrance of. I was working with a group of students back, I think it was around 1994 or something, 93, up in uh, Michigan. And they would do their things during the day, but we would have like, I don't know, two or three sessions a day with a small group of students. And then one day they came and they said, oh, David, we found something in the Course that we don't understand. I said, well, what, what is it? And they said, well, here's a part where Jesus says, no one can be angry at a fact. We don't get that. What, what does that mean? No one can be angry at a fact. What, that, that, that makes no sense whatsoever. I said, well, that's obvious. No one can be angry at a fact. And they said, well, first of all, then what's a fact? <laughs> and I said, God is a fact, and Christ is a fact, and no one can be angry at a fact. If you knew the fact of it, if you knew the reality of the truth of it, you wouldn't be angry. Anger always arises from a self-concept, always from a belief that there's something outside of you that can do something to you against your will. Why would God create a being where some things could happen to that being against their will? That is the strangest thing, but that's what the human condition is. It's the belief that something can happen that's unasked for, that, that is happening beyond us. And, and then we judge, this shouldn't be, you shouldn't act this way, you shouldn't be mad at me. I am innocent and you're trying to make me guilty. But when we're pointing the finger at whoever it is, we've already given the power away of the belief that they can do something to us that can make us angry. And Jesus says, no, you're, you're, I'm never upset for the reason I think, and no one can be angry at a fact, and only my thoughts injure me. Only my thoughts. Only believing in attack thoughts could bring injury. And that takes it off of an external world. Suddenly you're not the victim of an external world. If, if only my thoughts can injure me, those must be my grievances, my attack thoughts. So that's what this whole situation is really. It's like to take a closer look at responsibility. Where's my true responsibility? I'm responsible for my state of mind and I can be hurt by nothing but my thoughts. So, 
if I still am harboring any kind of grievances or judgments or attack thoughts, that is what I need to start exposing. That's where I need my prayers to go, my, my attention needs to go in praying for the healing of my mind. And then the other stuff, you just say, you bow and you say, thank you for that flare. <laughs> and not take it on personally, like, oh gosh, now what, what did I, do? I thought I handled this. <laughs> I handled it once. <laughs> it's like cleaning the tub, you know, you scrub it, you clean it, and a few months later, oh wow, I got to clean the clean it again. Jesus wants us to, you know, clean our hearts, you know, clean our minds to go for that purity. So thank you. Thank you for that. We all watch that flare go up and <laughs> we all listen to the answer. <laughs> yeah. Hello. Hi. Hi. So, highlighting collaboration, Michael and I are a husband and wife music duo with both very strong professional careers as musicians coming together. So that was the first collaboration that Jesus had to deal with, with us. Uh, in the last 18 months, we've been plunged into some very strong collaborations. Jesus, uh, we've been praying a lot together and Jesus had numerous miracles and he has sent us on travels. He has sent us uh, into circumstances where uh, experts have been brought in to help us. One of which is also with writing. He sent us a, a very accomplished <laughs> literary agent, author, movie producer, screenwriter to help me finish this book that I've been working on, been writing, inspired by Jesus, inspired by A Course in Miracles, a fiction book, mind you. He sent, and he's become our friend. And then he sent us with our music recordings in the last year, a young, very talented sound engineer who's also a producer, who's fallen in love with our music. He's a millennial, okay? On the ball, okay? Wonderkind, that term, we, we know what that means. <laughs> he's amazing and he's, he's fallen in love with our music. And what I wanted to say, uh, okay, so the next thing <laughs> that Jesus seems to be sending us on in our next trip after this is to Leiria, Portugal, with an event called Rockin' 1000, where a thousand musicians will be coming together in the stadium in, in Leiria to perform all at once. And what's interesting about that is back in February, I saw the um, beautiful Netflix documentary about the uh, We Are the World collaboration. And then about a few days later, you did a, a commentary on that. I'm like, Jesus, okay, what are you doing? And then a few days later, I was watching all the videos from We Are the World. And I was so caught up in the voices and the beautiful personalities and those amazing people. And next that came up on my YouTube was this Steppenwolf song, Born to be Wild, a thousand musicians. And I clicked on it. And there's a thousand musicians in Paris, France, all the, all the instruments, singers, everything, playing singing, performing this song together. And I was, I, the joy, the happiness, everyone in the crowd, all the musicians, I'm like, what is this? This is amazing. So the guy comes on at the end and says, please join us if you're a musician, please join us. So I took that as an invitation. So I checked it out. I didn't tell Michael. I checked it out and I felt like it was a nudge from Jesus. I, saw, I sent in our auditions, did all that, waited for about 30 days. And once we passed the audition, I said, Michael, I have a surprise. I think this is from Jesus. I think we're supposed to do this. So I showed him the Stefan Moult video. And uh, apparently, we are supposed to do this because we made it through the waiting list. Just got word of that last week. Well, one thing I want to say, and then I have a question. It comes very clear to me that 
all of these, some of these experts that have come to us, we could have sought out on our own, right, through the internet. We could have found a producer, we could have found a literary agent. But the way Jesus orchestrates it is so that we fall in love with each other. It's not transactional. We fall, we've fallen in love with Hayden. We've fallen in love with Manny, who, by the way, is Jewish, who has just written a screenplay about Jesus. <laughs> Only Jesus could orchestrate something like this, okay? Oh, so we're just blown away. All of which started after listening to you, David. Okay, we all know this. As soon as we clicked on David on YouTube, right? <laughs> Everything changed. <laughs> so my, the thing that's on my mind that the ego's bothering me with is money. How are we going to... We have some money. Give, Jesus has given us money. But how are we going to do this in Portugal? It seems like... A much bigger adventure for us. We're going, it's overseas. You mentioned what is, was it, what is it is on your mind? And that has been on my mind, especially in the last week when, we, you know, I was, we were off the waiting list and it seems like it's going that way. So I am sustained by the love of God. I understand, we, we've experienced that. But the ego's coming in with all this worry you know, because it seems like a much bigger thing for us to do together. Can we handle this? Can we do this? Is there going to be enough money? How's it going to work out? Do I need to do GoFundMe, which I've done before. And Anna, thank you for your stories with Kenneth, by the way. That really helped a lot because, you know, the, the, the getting rid of the shame because of asking, because uh, it's interesting how Jesus will put you in those situations where... It doesn't seem like every area may be answered yet. It's like, Jesus, how come all the money isn't there right now for later yet? How are we going to do this? So I guess that's, I wanted to speak on that and speak on collaboration and the falling in love. He wants us to fall in love with each other rather than it just being some sort of transactional thing. So I just wanted to speak on that. Thank you. <laughs> that's beautiful. It can feel God is so much love. It's in the movie tonight, there's back in the sixties, back in the sixties, seventies, there's a group called the Association. You ask me if there'll come a time I won't desire you. Mm, never my love. Mm, never my love. You know, Jesus and the God is so much love. And really your question is, is a question about means and end. Because if we agree that the end is to fall in love, or rise in love, as we have the rise band, we can get back from, rise in love, <laughs> rise into eternal life, rise into divine love. The doubt or the question comes in the means. And in this world, money is so, so, so associated with the means. You know, we can talk about skills and abilities, we can talk about a lot of different things, but, but even when we talk about collaboration, when it comes down to means, that's where the doubt arises. The question marks always come in the means. So what Jesus is teaching us in the Course, and I think I started to come into this before I came into the Course, because anybody ever hear of uh, humanistic psychology? Abraham Maslow, Carl Rogers. Um, Abraham Maslow, remember he was famous for his pyramid, his hierarchy of needs. It starts off with the basic needs and then you advance higher and higher. And then he studied the most self-actualized people either alive or dead, to start to come to what is it about self-actualization? Don't you even like the sound of that? Self-actualize. If the self is the Christ, you actualize your remembrance of your true self, the Christ. 
self-realization, self-actualization. I was fascinated. I, I got, when I started to study the top of the pyramid, one of the characteristics of self-actualization is that means and end are one. Means does not come before the end. Means and ends are actually one. So a painter's painting a painting, but the painter's in the flow of the painting. It's in the joy like the music. When you have the music flowing through you, it's everything. It's everything. But the thought comes in once we put it on the timeline. As soon as the thought comes in is, how much can I sell this painting for? Vroom. You feel the drop. <laughs> you're in the love and then how much can I get for this painting? Vroom. Or you're doing an album, you're in the flow of the music, you're loving it, loving it, in love with the producer, in love with everything, everyone, and then as soon as the, the, the timeline, the split between means and ends is where the doubt comes in. So, basically, in the Bible it talks about the love of money is the root of all evil. And I would say it's the belief in lack in the mind that projects meaning onto the money. You know, in Lesson 76, he, he talks about it so dispassionately. You know, green paper strips and piles of metal discs. He's poking fun at money. He's, he's poking fun at the idea that we've given meaning to something that seems to be external to us, that we are without. And then the need is, how do I get what I need to do what I want to do? And, and the key is, is that, that when a miracle brings the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end together, it brings the means and ends, the, the gifts of God are given means and ends together. God would not give you an end without also giving you the means to reach that end. That would be a cruel God to say, here's your end, try to reach it. <laughs> you know, that would be cruel if God gave the end without the means. So, then I'm going to go to a supplement of A Course in Miracles. It's this call, it was called The Song of Prayer. And in the Song of Prayer, Jesus has a great line, and it, when I first read that line, I was like, oh gosh. Because he says, he starts out the sentence with, he says, the secret of true prayer. When Jesus Christ starts a sentence with the secret of true prayer, I'm very interested to hear the end of the sentence, whatever it is. The secret of true prayer is to forget the things you think you need. Oh my God, from the Master, the secret of true prayer is to forget the things you think you need. You see, he's taking us into the present moment. You see, he's inviting us into the now. He's taking us into the gateway to eternity. To the world, the ego is like, bah humbug, that's the worst line ever written. <laughs> that, that is the most disgraceful line <laughs> ever written. The secret of true prayer is to forget the things you think you need. Do you think the writers of the book or the makers of the movie, The Secret, are going to forget the things they think they need? No, they're going to use the power of their mind to manifest the things that they think they need. But this is the difference between manifesting and love. <laughs> because love is, is a given. Love has no limits to it. It has no constraints. It has no conditions. It's a free gift. It's the grace of God. It's, it's what faith is all about. So, to me, that's what the whole parable of David about has been about being shown the miracles. And, and always with the miracle, there's a big smile on my face because it's still, even when I read a line like that, the secret of true prayer is to forget the things you need, it's like more, seek ye first the kingdom of heaven and all else will be added unto you. The kingdom of heaven and all the means of reaching the kingdom of heaven will be added. The people that need to be involved, everything that needs to be orchestrated to let go of the timeline is given. 
But I think it's important to remember our goals are not on the timeline. Our goals are to, like the Ram Das, be here now. Remember that book, Be Here Now? Such an amazing title of a book. That's always the goal. That's what I started off talking about today. The present moment is the goal. And we do want all things to fall away. So, in the, the singing of that beautiful music, you can feel the vibrancy of it, you can feel the allness of it, you can feel the completion of it, and then the ego will try to jump right in there and go, but, <laughs> where are you going to get the money? This has happened in the parable of David, on and on and on. I remember one time we were, we were driving down to the end of the canyon because we had seen that there was a, a, an abandoned church camp that was for sale. And so a group of us got in the car and said, let's just go and check it out. So we called a realtor to go there, open it up. We went down and it was indeed an abandoned church camp. It had been abandoned for a number of years. It was very half finished. But as we're approaching it, one of the women in the car, she goes, here you guys go again. Where you're going to get the money? Those were the two <laughs> lines that she had. Here you guys go again. Where you're going to get the money? We pull up and it's got a gate on it. And on the gate there's a, there's a, a sign. And it's the title of the church camp. And the, and the church camp's name is Master, M-A-S-T-E-R, Peace. P-E-A-C-E. -E. There it is again. Messages. So, Realtor opens the gate, we go in and we look at this whole thing. And then, as many, many times, things just flow where donations come, a patron comes, something comes offering the thing, and then we know it's a go. But we didn't ask the question, where are we going to get the money? <laughs> that was not on our mind. We just went there, we prayed, we felt the, the joy of it. We said, oh, this feels like, this, is this what you want? Is this an assignment? Is this a collaborative project? Oh yeah. I don't know, Jason's not here, but is anybody, was anybody involved here in the room? This, this project was, oh, there was a lot of blood, sweat, and tears that went in. There was a lot of healing that went into that. Because it, you know, we're not construction workers by trade. <laughs> electricians, contractors, you know, that's just not our field. And yet, over the period of, I think a couple, two and two and a half years, there were so many people involved in the, the restoration, the rebuilding, completely restoring that to be a fully functioning church camp, a camp where we did gatherings and retreats and it had a big wood-burning stove in it and it was overlooking the canyon down there. But that's another example among hundreds and thousands of examples of, of just guidance. You trust that when the guidance comes in, if you really feel it strongly, the means will be provided. That's just the way that it works. That's just the way the Holy Spirit works. The means are always, 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 always provided. And then it happens so many times that you get more convinced and more convinced. Okay, I see it. Means and end are the same. Okay, got it. One more time. Okay, got it. You know, it's just like Holy Spirit is like, whoosh, did you get it yet? Whoosh. Did you get it yet? You know, he just keeps throwing those miracles through over and over and over to wash away the belief in scarcity, which is the belief in linear time. You know, here we are at this moment, we're just rejoicing and sharing all this love and joy and wisdom in this moment. It's all there. It's all contained right here in this moment. And, and when we're in the joy, when we yield into that joy, we're not thinking about the past or thinking about the future. There's a part in the Course where Jesus says, at no single instant does the body exist at all. It is only remembered or anticipated. Oh, that must be the hypothetical trick of this world. 
This must be an entire cosmos of hypothetical, as if the separation happened. Jesus knows it didn't. But what if you are in a virtual reality of hypotheticals where the hypotheticals are playing out in the mind and a hallucination of a, of a world that doesn't even exist, of a dream world, is over. And we all know that no matter what's going on in the nighttime dream, when we wake up, if it's a nightmare, we wake up, we usually have, we wipe our forehead and go, wow. I'm glad that was just a dream because we're not in it anymore. We know how wonderful the wake up can feel. So I just keep coming back to it's a convincing job. You know, we're here to learn, to really learn that means and ends are together. Scarcity doesn't teach that. The Holy Spirit, Jesus do teach that. And and we, we see that in relationships, whenever we feel like there's difficulties in relationships, then we, the ego starts analyzing what's, what's wrong, what needs to change, do we need to go to therapy? And I have people telling me relationships are such hard work. Well, if you believe in the ego, relationships will seem to be hard work because there's going to be a lot of expectations and unfulfilled expectations that are tied in to that construct. But when you get into purpose and you really feel the means and ends are provided, it's more like your, your Rose and Jack at the very front of the Titanic and, and Rose is leaning out on the, over the front of the ship with the wind blowing her hair and Jack's got her anchored there and she's right on the cutting edge of whatever is coming because she's right in the front of the ship, right at that point. That's how we want to feel as a musician, as an artist. We're in that creative flow, we're in that flow, that vibe. We love the feeling, we want that feeling, we want to stay in that feeling, and we're just letting everything show us where we still believe the means and the ends are, are different. I think tonight's movie is going to be the answer uh, to your question. You just, you'll just sit back and go, whoa, it's going to just show me. Just Holy Spirit, Jesus, just show me. Because these are a bunch of world famous musicians, highly skilled, and they just want to learn to love and be kind and respectful. They want to feel that connection and you can feel it. It comes through the movie so strong. It's actually from a time period back in the United States in this place in LA called uh, Laurel Canyon. I've been there. I've done gatherings in Laurel Canyon. I felt the vibe there. I feel it again when I watch the movie. You know, I'm like, oh wow, it's mystical, it's magical. Because Laurel Canyon is, the, the musicians are all living in Laurel Canyon, a lot of them. The Beatles, of course, fly over. They go fly over to L.A. They go out right out to Laurel Canyon to, to be. I remember one time. Uh, I think Ringo stars in there. The Beatles, Ringo and George, flew over to L.A. and they hopped in the car. They said, "Let's go visit our friends in Laurel Canyon," and they drove up to one of the houses. And as they are driving up to the house. Uh, they look into the house and, and the musicians are all in there just dancing around inside the house naked. But apparently one of the musicians must look out and they look out and they see Ringo and George, the Beatles, getting out of the car. So they all rush to put their clothes on so that when Ringo and George come in, they've got clothes on. So Ringo and George, they come in and, and they go, what's going on here? And, and it's like, Ringo's like, that's not very, very much of a hippie. Why, why did you put your clothes back on? <laughs> like they're coming to Laurel Canyon for the freedom, <laughs> the joy, and then it's the Beatles. You see, it's the concept. It's the Beatles. We've got to be dressed <laughs> when the Beatles come in, you know. And they have all kinds of stories they tell. They're all in one of their houses and they're having a big party and I think I think maybe they're smoking some weed or something and it's, it's loud sounds of music going on and then the policeman knocks at the door 
And uh, one of the guys that owns the house, he he hears it's the cops, and so he's up in the bathroom and he sneaks out. And the owner of the house drops out of the back door when the cops come. And then the people find out later on and tell him, and he says, okay, that's another private thought. You know, it's another thing that he's got to forgive. It's just you can see that there's forgiveness happening all the time, but we don't even have to call it forgiveness. That's just a word. That's what the Spirit is doing, is helping us fall in love and release the past, release these fears, release these doubts. That's what I love about this movie, is you can feel it. You can feel it happening through everyone. And nobody's talking metaphysics. Nobody's talking Course in Miracles. Nobody's talking religion. They're just into music. And they're just letting the music take them and lift them higher and higher and higher just through these beautiful holy encounters and interactions. So, yeah, I think the answer is coming tonight. I think you'll feel it. <laughs> I think we'll all feel it. <laughs> yeah. Stephania. Hi, David. Hi, everyone. Feeling so thankful to be here. Um, my question is in regards to a sort of phase I found myself in. Um, when I had my deep awakening, um, blossoming of the heart, as I like to call it, because that's what it felt like, so many identities dropped away. So many concepts fell that I, yeah, just it was so natural, you know, my musical identity, um, the just my the judgment on my body, my just the care about my body, that just fell away. One is very tied to the other, the musical identity and the body. And then <clears throat> slowly but surely also my relationship, uh, you know, like being a wife or the concept of being a mom, all these things. And in these stages, when musical identity fell away, music fell away like my attraction to music, I, and I understood that it was I needed to completely step away because my foundation was so tied egoically to music that I needed to first release music completely. Um, it was sort of a death, yeah, it was a, a death of that and I didn't know if I was gonna sing again or, you know. Um, and so that happened in many different instances over a course of time. And I also found myself not being attracted to anything, not being attracted to anyone, not being able to look, especially, for example, men who, before my awakening, would always, you know, there would always be some sort of private thought or interest. And I felt so freed from that. Um, and now that I've gone into you know, really making uh, the relationship with the father of my child, a very, you know, giving it over to spirit and um, us really using it for healing and for our own self discovery with a capital S. Yeah. Um, and coming to prayer, learning to come to prayer together, even if there's no end of being together, you know, so freeing all these concepts. But now I find myself in a stage where I have desires I didn't have before. And I feel like, it, is this going away? I'm attracted, you know, I'm attracted to other people now. I see people a certain way, I see their bodies. So I'm feel, I, there's like this feeling of like loss of connection with God. And then I'm like, well, maybe I'm integrating. Maybe I need to come back and put it all to practice. And I, and I see that. But there is this like inner resistance and inner desire to be true to that desire and not judge it. And so I kind of find myself like, yeah, in that sway between like, no, this is just ego stuff, you know, come back to God, come back to God. And then it's like, well, wait, if there is this like flow and desire, why not just allow it to be and, and then see where it leads and don't judge it so much. Um, so I find myself there and I feel like, yeah, I don't know if you have anything. It, it's it's a little tricky to me. It feels like a tricky situation um, because it brings up fear about me losing this contact that I so clearly 
had and still have now by choice, whereas before it was a gift, I, I have it now by choice. I can choose again every time and, and come, you know? But yeah, I'm kind of struggling with seeing people as people. And something that has helped me, is, especially with the opposite sex, is when I see what they look like, you know, and I'm, because I did it for so long. I just saw their Christ. I saw their innocence. No matter what they look like, whether it was quote unquote unattractive in the eyes of the world or attractive in the eyes of the world, I had none of that. <clears throat> something that helped me when I began to see attraction, attractive people again, let's say, or beautiful women again, like actually defining them as this and that, is I am here to be truly helpful. And I would look at them and say that to myself, and that it would, it would be, there would be a sudden detachment of who they are. Like, it has nothing to do with me. I'm just here to be truly helpful, and it would connect me to the Christ again, that sort of, but yeah, I'm struggling with this, like going back to the body identity, and is it integration, is it just, a trap. Yeah, that I'm glad you're bringing that up because, you know, I mentioned yesterday about the the dream that you dream in secret, the unconscious mind, the dream that you gave away, which is the projected world. But yeah, the unconscious is is the is the unwatched mind. It's the pushed out of awareness mind. It's the suppressed mind. It's the repressed mind, and and things will continue to come up. So. It's not that you should be surprised when they do. You go through a period of like, oh, I'm really floating, floating, desirelessness. Uh, I'm the Christ. I'm awake. Oh, this is it. Take me. Beam me up, Scotty. Right now. And then all of a sudden the desires start to come. Oh. <laughs> uh oh. Uh <laughs> oh. Uh oh. <laughs> but, but, you know, what a masterful plan. You know, the Holy Spirit can use what the ego made. And the ego made lots of false desires for idols. And so, but the Holy Spirit is a master at using what the ego made. So the, the Holy Spirit works with that. I mean, even with the movie tonight, you know, everyone in the movie has a desire to make music, make beautiful music. And the Holy Spirit's like, good, we can work with that. You know, we'll get you back to eternal life. Uh, no problem at all. It's just the self-judgment when we feel something and we judge ourselves based on the desire or based on the thing, based on some kind of standard we have, we've got standard now in our mind and we're judging ourselves against that standard. But I've found that the Holy Spirit uses these desires in the most way, amazing ways. Like even with attraction, you know, the Spirit knows that there's the lesson of letting go and the lesson of forgiveness, but the spirit knows the mind so well that it will actually use attractions to undo the attractions. It's, it's the Holy Spirit is so masterful. It's not, we don't have to judge like, oh, I've gone wrong, now I've got all these things going wrong. That's just self-judgment. The Holy Spirit's here to teach us we don't, we can't really judge at all. You know, that's just a, an ego ability that was made up. So, I find that those things with attraction, sometimes you, you meet people, you talk to people, it's part of the plan of undoing, of, of facing things. How else are we going to let things go unless they come into awareness? If we're not even aware of them, how are we going to release them? We have to become aware of them, they have to get exposed, and that's what happens. But we also notice not only the attractions, but we notice the repulsions. Because those are equally capable of bringing us into forgiveness. When we're repulsed by something that we're really, is part of our mind, and we say, oh, but for the grace of God, there go I. As if we're judging somebody else or s something else as being less than uh, or something we, we don't want, we don't desire, we're repulsed by, those are really helpful. Because you start to notice whether you have attractions or aversions, it must be that every circumstance is, has salvation in it, in the spirit, regardless of what the attraction or the aversion is. And I do feel like this movie tonight is good because clearly it's just a bunch of young people who love to make music and they're attracted to the music, they're attracted sometimes 
they're attracted to each other. I mean, you bring a group of people together, even in a band, and there's going to be attractions and repulsions. Uh, I think of uh, Mama Cass and what was the group? The Love it, Mamas and the Papas. You know, two men, two women coming together to be in a band. You think there's going to be attractions and repulsions? Yeah. Yes, Michelle Phillips ends up marrying uh, one of the men. But in this movie she talks about she talks about having already had an affair and faced all the emotions of a previous affair. So when she wants to have an affair on her husband, she's now it's like a second go round. And she's actually starting to question the whole idea of exclusive love. This is, remember, the 60s and the 70s. The, Jesus is teaching us, that's why there's nine chapters in The Course in Miracles, from 15 to 24, about letting go of relationships, special relationships, and love and hate relationships. There is no other topic that gets nine chapters in a row in the Course. He's basically saying, you're almost to heaven. You've almost reached heaven. One more obstacle to go past, and you're there. Just one. And he's also describing the special relationship as the ego's boasted gift and weapon. He even uses the word weapon. What? You're talking about romantic relationships as weapons? Oh, that's when people start to stuff their faces. That's when people... <laughs> No, no, not those chapters, please. That's like, oh my God, what is he talking about? He's talking about agape love. He's talking about universal love. He's talking about divine love. He's talking about love for God. And that's why it's the greatest block to the kingdom of heaven, to remembrance that, because it's filled with attack thoughts and attractions and aversions. <laughs> You almost think of the human condition as synonymous with attractions and aversions. So what Jesus is saying is, just stay with me when you go through this fantasy land. Stay with me in mind. Keep coming back to me. Bring it back to me. And when you have these desires, don't judge yourself for them. Bring them to me. Give them to me. Give them to me. Give your aversions to me. Give your attractions to me. There's a great gem, which is forgiveness. This is the, the great gateway to the Kingdom of Heaven that is there. But you have to allow, you have to allow the things to come up from the unconscious mind that, that need to come up. You can't judge yourself for the desires. You have to give them to the Holy Spirit. Obviously the Holy Spirit and Jesus have, are using time and space and orchestrating it in a way where they're so light-hearted and they can, they can laugh at anything because they know the world's not real. But when we hide those desires from the Holy Spirit and Jesus, then we take personal responsibility for them and we feel guilty. We believe in a private mind with private thoughts and private desires. And some of the good desires and some of the bad desires. Then we study the Course for years, we go, okay, God is a good desire, <laughs> and then the rest are not. <laughs> and then we judge, 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 judge. And, and the Holy Spirit's like, give them to me. That's my job. <laughs> I'm, the, I'm the light. I'm the one. I'm the corrector. I'm the comforter. I'm the one that takes away the sins of the world. I'm the one that can handle it. That's my job. <laughs> Let me do my job. Give the desires over to me so I can do my job. My job is I shine them away. It doesn't matter. Aversions, I shine them away. Attractions, I shine them away. You see, it's taking it on as if Stephania has desires. Stephania didn't seem to have so many, now they're back. Uh-oh. You know, that's not the problem. It's, it's who you're going to call. <laughs> you know, it's, it's really who you're going to call on, you know. 
really, who are you going to give them to? If you give them to the ego, the ego is going to give you a guilt trip like you've never <laughs> experienced before. If you give them to the Holy Spirit, what do you get? La, 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 live for today. Hey, la, 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 live for today. And don't worry about tomorrow anyway. Oh, doesn't that feel good? That's, uh, that's how it feels with the Holy Spirit. It's la, la, la. Yeah, it's, it's like no problem. You know, if, if the Holy Spirit and Jesus could speak, they would say, we're fine with fake. We're fine with fake. Yeah. And, and they give it to me, yeah, we're fine, I can handle that, yeah, you know. I'm attracted to this one, give it to me, I can handle it. I, I don't never want to see that person and speak to them again ever in my life. Give that one to me too, <laughs> you know. Take it away, take it away. That's how we, we wake up with joy and with laughter, you know, because it's the, it's the taking the judgment seriously and focusing our mind's energy on that that, that brings us down. It brings it into, into contraction. Yeah. Oh my gosh, the time is already flown. <laughs> okay.